Hello once again everyone. So a bit of a different video for you today. This is going to be a little more talky as opposed to me strutting about the school, um, swinging a sword around and discussing moves. This is going to be a bit more niche. Um, and what it is is I wanted to talk about a book that I read a bit ago, um, The Fighting Man of Japan by Francis James Norman. Now, this is not Last Samurai 2, Return of the Weeaboo, right? This is instead, rather than being that kind of armchair or slightly distant or misconception um, period piece on Japanese fighting, it's honestly a very good read in general. And also, it's from a fencer's perspective and a practitioner's perspective, which I appreciate because this is not someone who watched some Japanese fencing and went, oh, okay, that's that's this thing, and, you know, discounted it. But neither is it someone who went full-on, you know, obsessed with everything Japanese. Instead, it's someone who was originally a cavalry officer in the British Army, moved to Japan, and this is in the 1880s, by the way, moved to Japan, spent a good amount of time there practicing their arts and gained an appreciation for it that way, and then actually brought it back to the UK, um, and as near as I can tell, opened the first kendo school in the UK uh, around 19, I believe it would be 05, uh, maybe a little bit before that. And as such, that's a really interesting story for one, and it's a firsthand account that you don't normally find. I mean, you just don't find firsthand sources like this, let alone ones that are from such a neutral perspective. And I'm going to talk about that more. But the reason I wanted to go over is, one, it is just a fascinating read, and I've put a link to it in the description. But two, like I said, it's from a fencer's perspective, and it's an honest fencer's perspective. It's not someone who's just looking at a move and then trying to deduce things from it. It's someone who has practiced it with first-generation practitioners, not learning it, you know, secondhand, secondhand, whatever. He went to Japan, immersed himself in that, and drew his own conclusions. And there's even quite a bit of back and forth that I really appreciate. And the reason I wanted to go over that was because from a modern practitioner's perspective, you can get quite a bit of bias going both ways. Um, when it comes to revitalizing the Western martial arts, I find some people intentionally or unintentionally disparage the arts of Asia um, in various ways, and not even just Japan. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily justified. Sure, there are some things where, and don't get me wrong, it gets annoying like when you're trying to explain how the longsword works and someone's just like, well, the katana will beat it. It's like, oh, God. But anyway, there are, however, some important differences in style that need to be considered because arts exist in their native countries for a reason. And that is something to be understood and even learned from but there's there's that part and then there's also just the approach when it comes to admiring a different style and i do use that word admire because i think all styles should be admired for their worth um you know for example there are sword styles that are quite popular in hema that i don't practice i don't do bolognese for example i don't do any bolognese sides or i know a little bit of it but i don't actively practice it it's not because I don't like it, it's because it doesn't interest me as much as other things I practice, but I gain an appreciation for it, and I understand the basic tenets of it, and there are even times when I'll use those few techniques I do know because they are the best suited to the situation, and I see his perspective, the way he writes about it, as being of the same mind, and I think that is something that more people should try to live by, if you will, especially if you live in the world of martial arts where underneath the surface, no matter how friendly we are, there's always that little bit of, oh, well, if my style met your style, you know? And it's just all because we get to do that. We're not in a modern situation where the moves you pick may endanger your life, um, which is nice. I really like that. But anyway, so to give a little bit of context um, to the words we're about to read, and I'll be kind of referencing back and forth here and there, um, F.J. Norman was a cavalry officer in the 11th and then 14th Hussars. Um, and specifically, he was, let's see here, he started his career in 1876 with the 11th, then eventually finishes as a sergeant in 1881, joins up with the 14th, and I don't know why um, he ended up shifting regiment, anything, you know, usual army nonsense, uh, joined the 14th, and then eventually was deployed to the Near East, Near East, 
India, Bombay specifically, um, before leaving the 14th Hussars in 1886. And then he um, arrives in Tokyo in 1888. And that's kind of when the story picks up. He doesn't actually give a ton of detail about his background, which I found rather interesting. He doesn't write very much about his older uh, fencing style. He just kind of goes right into the subject matter. Um, and I think there's there's two reasons for this. Number one is that back then his background isn't uncommon. To us, it's super interesting because we, you know, we I haven't gotten to meet cavalry officers who were trained to fight on horseback with swords. Um, but at the time, you could probably meet one without that much difficulty. Um, so that is an important thing to consider, is that he probably didn't write about it because for his audience that he intended this book for, it wasn't odd. Um, though it's unfortunate that as a modern reader, I kind of have to do a bit of digging to find out what I could about him. Um, and we'll get back to that background again in a moment. But on the Japanese side, an important thing to consider is that up until the 1870s, armor was still relatively commonly used in warfare. Um, it's not too far away from the Meiji Restoration and things of that nature, the final death of the samurai class in Japan and its beginning of true westernization, um, which it's not going to be a historically accurate film like 100%, but if you want to get just an idea of that culture clash, Watching The Last Samurai does help a lot. I mean, you've got telegraph wires, but then you've got people in, like, rickshaws. It, you've got swords being worn, but then you've got guys who are, no kidding, grew up samurai, adopting Western fashion, even carrying Western swords. It's a very weird time um, that he is in Japan. Now, another important thing to consider is that while, yes, it's not going to be quite the, the again, the classical sort of samurai. I talked about this in my... Um, Jin Sakai Stone Stance Breakdown. It's not the classical sort of samurai that we think of, but still these were within one generation or so, maybe two generations, of guys who fought in war. So as such, the sword schools, while they were still quite diverse and there was definitely some weird niche nonsense, if you want to read about crazy stuff, go read about that, you had reliable swordsmen. Um, and he does learn from some very reliable swordsmen. In fact, the first people he really learns from are the sword masters for the police station, um, which, you know, that's actually originally how uh, Jigoro Kano, the father of judo, that's kind of his first uh, his first thing as well. He taught judo to the police, which, you know, lends its credence. But anyway, so enough prattling on, let's kind of get into what his words are. So he arrives in uh, 1888 and eventually he takes up the study of Kinjitsu. Now, he got in touch with the authorities, again, started learning from um, the fencing master of the Takanawa police station. Um, and he gives a little bit of, of context about how he was, you know, kind of just generally getting the basics with them and then eventually gets set up to uh, fence with a more established school and even some of the better fighters in the area. Now, this is where he kind of gets into his actual comparison between Western and Eastern styles of swordsmanship. And I'm going to read his exact words here. I still recommend you read it yourself. But I'm going to read his exact words here and quote him so that we can get an idea of it. So, writing as an old cavalryman with plenty of experience of regimental drill grounds and gymnasiums, I can safely say that the Japanese system of teaching swordsmanship is far and away superior to the absurd sword exercise in vogue in the British Army, and that for rough, dismounted work, the Japanese system of two-handed swordsmanship is much superior to the systems of Europe. Now, on paper, that, you know, just kind of sounds like, ah, everything Japanese is better, but he doesn't stop there. In fact, his next statement kind of contradicts what he just said a little bit. A first-class French or Italian duelist would more than probably best a first-class Japanese swordsman, but only so if fighting on ground thoroughly suitable to his own peculiar style of swordplay. On rough ground, on a hillside, or on ground covered with, imped with impediments, the Japanese swordsman would more than likely have the advantage, or in other words, in position where rough and tumble fighting is going on, and where men want to kill and kill quickly without attending to too much detail of form over it. Now, 
What he's talking about there is he's not saying that Japanese swordsmanship is just better than Western swordsmanship. What he's saying is that there's a difference between fighting in the school and fighting for real. And I can even put a little bit of personal um, anecdote here. Not that I've been in a real sword fight, or even a real fight for that matter, and God willing, I never will. But the point he's making is that, especially with more regimental system, or just people who are more used to fighting on even ground, the first time you fight on uneven ground, or slick ground, or just weird ground, or your shoe isn't fitting right, etc., or even just fighting barefoot for the first time, it changes things. And if you're not used to that, then it makes a huge impact in your confidence in your own fighting ability. Now, that's not necessarily to say that the moves themselves are hard counters to each other. What he's saying is more about the men and what they're accustomed to doing. So, personal anecdote here. I have fenced in the dark, and that's a weird thing. Um, I fenced with longsword, rapier, and backsword. And I will say, definitely out of the few, the backsword was the scariest. And the reason I say that is because in the fade light, I couldn't see the blades very easily. Rapier, you always have to have a thrusting tip on it to play safely. Um, and as such, I could just keep my eye on that. With backsword, you don't. Um, it's perfectly safe to fence without a thrusting tip. And as such, certain angles of the blade, it would go invisible on me. Um, that was a weird aspect to see. And because it's only in one hand it could rotate to various different angles that I couldn't really account for on guesswork. Longsword, I could guess it. Um, now, in regards to the rough and tumble ground, that I've seen a lot. Um, I have fenced on slight hillsides. I have fenced on rocks. I have fenced, again, in the dark. I fenced on wet ground. I fenced on a waxed gymnasium floor. That was hilarious. Um, but either way, very quickly it comes down to you have to make a choice between, okay, normally I would lunge this deeply, but I'm lunging downhill. I can't do that. Um, or normally I'd shift my weight here. I really can't do that either. Or just choosing what the most mechanical advantage you can do. These All these little micro adjustments that aren't that hard to do necessarily. But if you're in a real and life or death situation, you don't have that kind of time. And that panic state can quickly cause you to lose faith in your style and or to lose faith in your ability to execute your style. Because if your style didn't work, it wouldn't have gotten you this far. You just need to adapt it to the situation. On the other hand, if you've always trained with that kind of in mind, which by default Japanese swordsmanship does, then it's not a problem. You don't have that delay and you can have faith in your style of fighting. But he says if we were on more even ground, possibly the French or Italian duelist would win. And that is something to consider, is that there is a, a French officer who bested, I don't remember exactly how much, I think it was at least like five or three to one, he bested several Japanese swordsmen by himself. And probably he did that by sticking to his system. Now we can't necessarily, or making that adaptation, we can't confirm that, but it does happen. It did happen. Usually the man who adapts to the situation first and foremost is going to be the one that wins. And he points that out rather clearly. Now... Another thing he talks about is the idea of rough and tumble fighting. He's going to get into this more, and we're going to talk about that when we get there. As a weapon of offense and defense, a katana is an infinitely superior one over the ridiculous single-handed sword with its 36-inch blade, which the British infantry officers are armed. Now, that's one I want to talk about very specifically, because another part that we need to talk about context-wise is the author's bias, because there's always going to be a little bit of it. Even from his relatively neutral approach, there is still going to be bias. And he doesn't say that he's unbiased. He doesn't claim to be. Now, as near as I can tell, he never says, but as near as I can tell, he was probably referring um, to specifically either the 1845 pattern of sword or quite possibly the 1857. Um, I don't know which of these two patterns. These are both infantry patterns. I don't know which one it was. Um, in fact, it may even have been uh, the 1827 pattern, as patterns of swords were you know, reused for quite a while, even though they had the new pattern in. Um, but a 36-inch blade I can personally talk about because I just happen to have a 36-inch blade right here. Uh, this is my new backsword blade. I haven't put it on its uh, handle yet, but this is 36 inches from uh, the fourth, where it meets the guard, all the way to the tip. Now, normally... My backsword on the wall behind me is a 34-inch blade, and that I find is 
about perfect for me. Um, I went for the 36 because I didn't quite understand the measurement that people were asking for. But either way, um, 36 inch blades are definitely on the longer side. Um, not too bad, but it's getting to the point of being slightly uncomfortable at times. Last, just last night, I fought with a um, 38 inch blade on a Schiavona, and I will definitely say, unless you have the true measure of your opponent, um, are very, very strong, or favor the point, 38 inches is a little bit much for that sword. Um, now, that's just my personal opinion. I am an average man in regards to strength, uh, above average height, but other people I even personally know would be perfectly comfortable with that. But your average person, 36 inches and 38 inches is on the longer side of comfortable for a infantry saber slash backsword. Now, just for sake of comparison, by the way, I don't have a Shanai, but I do have a Boken here. And if I put them fort to fort and then move it over to the tip, you'll see there is a significant blade advantage there. But comfort-wise, this I can wield all day in one hand or two. This one I can't. Now, another important thing is that he later references his height when he talks about his preference of Shanai, and he says that he's five foot six. Now, certainly... I'm a six foot uh, four individual. 36 inch blade and 38 inch blade is going a little bit too far for me, preference wise and just feeling wise. Um, but if you're five foot six, that's even harder for you to use. So I really can't blame him there. Um, now, the other sword that he most likely used in cavalry, because I mean, we're talking about, he probably, he references the infantry specifically there. He's probably fenced with it more than a few times, and probably fenced in gymnasiums, etc. Um, but the weapon he would have definitely had to drill with was either the 1853 or 1864 pattern of cavalry sword, which, from what I can tell, was a bit of a beast and a little bit unwieldy uh, here and there, and were the Pattern wasn't really improved upon for quite a while uh, until we get into the 1890s, which he could not be referencing here because by that time he was out of active service. Um, so these are both all rel sorry these three are all relatively beefy long swords that I can't blame him for not being terribly comfortable with. Now it's his personal preference, um, and he does mention that size and strength plays a factor into your comfort with that sword. Um, but tall, short. Big, strong, weak, whatever, this does feel a little bit more comfortable just by default. Um, and being able to put two hands on a sword always makes it easier to wield, I find. Um, but either way, I've prattled on enough. Let's get back into his words. Do, 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 do. <laughs> ah, here we go. And with slight modifications in its make and use, the katana could be rendered still more effective. We don't actually know what he's referencing there specifically, but he does get back to the point. Um, in the first place, the blade is considerably shorter, from 10 to 15 inches, as in from uh, 36 inches, um, thus allowing for the majority of men greater freedom of movement, for nobody can deny that to a dismounted man a long scabbard is a horrible nuisance, and that in a shortishly inclined man it is an absolute encumbrance. That is definitely true. Uh, fight with a scabbard on your hip sometime and tell me what you think of it, because it is sometimes an absolute nightmare. <laughs> but, though the shorter in the blade, the katana has a longer grip, and, with one, and when one has learnt to use it all right, in its truly wonderful, what little length of reach is lost. This great length of grip permits the use of both hands for the purpose of delivering crushing blow or cut, and, moreover, after practicing the Japanese style of fencing, a swordsman becomes quite ambidextrous. How very disconcerting this last is to an opponent, all swordsmen are fully aware. And when to this is added the fact that a katana play is closer play than that of the cut and thrust sword of the Occident, Europe, it must be admitted that it is infinitely superior one for it, sorry, to it, for this one is the great purpose of fight to the death. It is certainly in... Ugh, sorry, apologies. It is certainly not so taking to the eye as, let's say, French or Italian swordsmanship's play, but while there is less ostentatious art and ceremony about it, there certainly is just as much science, and it might also be added as much, if not more, deadly intent. Now, what he's talking about there 
is he does say that the basically putting two hands on the sword does not take away your length, and that is true to an extent. Having one hand on the sword means I can stand more profiled and thus elongate my arm further does give you more reach. But with a little bit of practice, you learn to compensate for that with footwork, more so than just actually reaching out your arms. Not to mention, what he's talking about in regards to becoming quite ambidextrous, very quickly after using two hands on a sword, when you do learn a one-handed swordsmanship style, it's not difficult for you to switch because it's just, okay, same cuts, I know what muscles I need to use. And to a certain extent, having two hands on the sword does train both arms a little bit more. Not fully equally. They're still doing separate jobs. But it does somewhat give you a bit more of a foot in the door. Um, and he will reference later specifically doing one-handed techniques like this, basically, where it's one hand on the sword, but they're in the same place. And that, I think, is what he's more meaning here. And it can be very disconcerting, as I've actually spoken about before. But... Either way, from here, uh, he mostly just discusses his actual time in the uh, Takanawa, sorry, what is, it? what is the actual word for it? Do, 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 in the, yeah, Takanawa uh, fencing room, so the Takanawa police station, and that he eventually meets an older um, gentleman who is actually the uh, from the line of um, fencing instructors to the late Shogun, which is quite a pedigree. Um, but either way, um, he references the idea that he, he fenced him and then they actually ended up getting along, which is great. And really just goes to show you that even though you may have a little bias coming in, you never really know someone to fight them. Just play with them a little bit. Draw your conclusions after that because you really do learn a lot more about them, um, assuming that they're safe. But anyway, um, so he ends up forming a close friendship and really kind of becoming part of the, the crew, if you will, at this fencing school. And from there, he goes on to describe equipment, which is another really interesting bit that I wanted to get into, um, especially having gotten to see modern kendo equipment. And that's why I'm going to be talking about a lot here, because the gear hasn't really changed on their front. But the kabuto, or helmet, is in many respects far superior to the mask worn by the saber players of Europe. But while it gives ample protection to the face, neck, and throat, it does not sufficiently protect the sides of the head, nor yet its top or crown. It is much firmer, however, than do... Sorry, it sits much firmer, however, than do any of our fencing helmets or masks being tied, or rather lashed, on the head. Now, this is something I can talk about personally, because I have encountered kendo helmets, and they're definitely a little more soft on the sides, um, and I would not trust that. They are quite well built here, and another thing to consider is that he's not talking about modern fencing masks. He's talking about historical fencing masks, which they kind of vary. Um, I've not gotten the chance to play in one, so I had to kind of go looking, and finding old fencing equipment is surprisingly difficult. Um, I found some images, uh, mostly photographs, of old um, bits of people bouting, and it seems as though... You had kind of a leather cover over parts of it sometimes, uh, a wire mesh here, though that could vary um, in design. Sometimes it was horizontal strips, very similar to a um, kabuto. Other times it was more mesh like what we're used to. And I've also heard that some had steel plates here and just varying degrees. Now that does extend much further back. And so there's hard mesh always between your ears or the top of your head and your incoming blow. So... In regards to it being more secure, I don't actually know how they were attached. Probably just slip on the same as we're used to, and masks do come off decently often. If it was literally lashed to my head or locked down in some way, that would be quite nice. Um, no lie. But um, later he goes on, he follows that up with describing under it is inevitably worn uh, a tenguri. Sorry, there's no R in that. Tenugi. I believe is how you say that. Um, sorry, my Japanese is terrible unless we're talking about judo, and even that's just passable. Or small native towel wrapped around the head in a turban-like fashion, as shown in the photograph in which I am seen standing by the side of Umezawa-san. For the reason of this is purely cleanly or sanitary nature, and it is the result that no Japanese helmets ever have an unpleasant odor. That I can definitely talk about, because I wear a head sweat. I wear it Partially to keep my hair out of my face. Um, also, even when I have short hair, I still wear it. I like having that extra layer between me, my scrum cap, and my helmet. It does soak up a lot of sweat. Um, and don't, don't, don't kid yourselves. 
everybody's gear gets a serious odor to it. And having a couple extra layers between you and your gear does save it somewhat. Um, so I can definitely attest that that is probably a big factor. And if it was made of uh, linen or cloth, then it would actually suck up a little bit more. Mine is some sort of modern acrylic. Um, if I wore my coif um, that I wear underneath my helmet, so a historical linen coif, that definitely sucks up a lot of my, uh, my gunk, if you will. The dough, or corslet, is a lighter, cooler, and in every way far superior to the chest and body protection to the leather jerkins of European saber players. It is made of slips of very uh, best and soundest bamboo, strung perpendicularly together in the required shape and trimmed and strengthened with fastenings of leather, silk, or hemp. And the best dough are lacquered with a mon, or crest of the owner, and remarkably handsome some of them are. They are worn hanging somewhat loosely, being suspended from the shoulders by soft cords of cotton and silk, but never so loosely as to prove a nuisance to the swordsman. Now, this kind of somewhat I can, I can see. Um, I've never worn a dough myself. I'd really like the chance to, but I have gotten to handle a couple of them. And as for what he's comparing it to, I don't actually know, because I, I, again, finding old pictures of this is relatively difficult, but... It seems as though it was kind of a boxy sort of protection. It looks a bit almost like a brig, but rather than wrapping around, it's just a solid box, um, sometimes with one cut out for your arm to get a little bit more reach. And it looks pretty uncomfortable, not shaped to the person at all. And I can definitely see why he wouldn't be a huge fan of it. Um, versus a doe is going to sit a lot more like a breastplate, actually. And they're very similar to breastplates in pretty much every way. And as such, it, that slight indent means you can put your arms across each other, which is super nice. Um, as for how loose they hang, I don't know. Uh, he says it's loose enough that it's comfy, but not so loose that it's a problem. So somewhere in the middle. I could definitely see why he would favor that over that boxy thing I was looking at. Just looking at it looks uncomfortable. Um, but it all of his comments do kind of make me wonder how he would feel about modern Hema gear. I think he'd probably be a fan of it, um, as certainly we get to draw from a couple other sources. Though also as a note, he doesn't mention like the jacket or anything along those lines. And some images I have seen, they're wearing somewhat padded, similar to a gambeson, but not quite. Uh, sometimes it's just padded on like your lead arm. Other times it's just a jacket. Sometimes there seems to be um, kind of like leather protection underneath. It seems to vary, um, and I don't have any first-hand resources or even images that confirm that. But either way, I can still see why I'd be a fan of the dough. The kusadzuri, or tases, I think he means like tacits, basically, are light and efficient enough protector for the lower part of the body, but hardly as good as those in use in British gymnasiums. Now, what he's talking about there is the... Um, ends of the dough that come off. It's basically a skirt that you wrap around yourself. I don't know what he's referencing in regards to the British gymnasiums. I tried my best to find any images or even descriptors, but near as I can tell, the only thing I've got is basically thick trousers or even kind of like leather leg guards, essentially, that go on your thigh. And I'm not surprised by this, as quite a lot of the play would involve hard cuts to the lead leg, so definitely having that is super nice. Um, but I don't actually know what he's specifically referring to that is, in his own opinion, better than what the Japanese are wearing. Now, we don't know whether or not this is because of personal preference, but my guess would be because less cuts are going to be landing on the leg in this system. And as such, having better thigh protection if you're dealing with that is more preferable. Da, 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 and I won't go into the descriptor of how that's constructed. It's basically the same as the dough. Um, just more horizontal as opposed to vertical. Uh, da, 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 da. It does not impede movement, however, at all. The cote, or gauntlet, is a hand, wrist, and forearm guard, much superior in many ways, uh, in many respects to anything of the sort to seen in our gymnasiums. The cote is made of strong cotton and hemp and canvas, lined with bamboo shavings or horsehair, and trimmed and strengthened with soft kid-like leather. One great advantage of the Japanese kote uh, that possesses over our gauntlets is that its size can be regulated up to quite an appreciable degree by the loosening or tightening of the leather lacing running along the inside of its forearm portion. Now, I will definitely agree with him here. Kote are awesome. Um, I got to handle a pair that one of my students who is a kendoka has, and 
while I would not wear them for sparring with steel long swords or mess or anything along those lines, they'd be great for in a uh, basket or if I was doing something along those lines or just for light training. They're really comfy um, and decent amount of padding on the back. Uh, they're basically like a Spez Heavy glove if you pulled it out of the protection. And I can't speak for their adjustment, but apparently it's it's relatively simple. So I will agree with them there. Kote are awesome. Wouldn't use them for steel longsword, uh, but for general practice or for things along those lines, yeah, probably. Uh, and also a note, I don't know what he's talking about in regards to European style gauntlets. I couldn't, again, I couldn't find any confirmed images of that, but we can assume they were using some form of probably proto lacrosse glove slash, you know, like leather gauntlet thing. But I can't confirm that. That's pure speculation on my part. But he says it wasn't as great, so there is that to consider. And again, this is still all personal opinion on his part. Do do do. Uh, da, da, da. Next, he talks about the Shanai um, and just gives it a basic descriptor. Um, I won't go into that because he doesn't. The only bit that he really makes that's important for what I'm trying to cover with this video is that the length and weight of the Shanai is entirely up to the practitioner. Um, and as opposed to in gymnasiums, or more importantly, regimental drill, you don't get a choice. This is the pattern, this is the length, deal with it. Um, and so he appreciates that very much. And he actually gives us specifically his um, his preferred length. Let's see, where is it? Mm -hmm. The measurements of my favorite Shanai are blade 26 inches and grip 14 inches, but it must be pointed out here that I stand but a trifle over 5 foot 6 inches and have somewhat small hands. So, basically, you know, he, he took the thing that feels good to him. Um, I haven't actually measured my Boken here. I really should have done that before I started this video. Oh well, I'll uh, put the measurements in the description. But, honestly, I've, I've had some people say, hey, this looks a little short for you, and this feels just right for me. It's not particularly long. Um, so preference doesn't surprise me in the slightest. Uh, I will say that in regards to having the grip be 14 inches, that is decently significant. Um, so maybe he just preferred a little bit more grip for lever cutting. Um, I don't know. Uh, then he goes into the Hakama, uh, which is the divided skirt slash trousers, um, that they'd be wearing. And I wish I had a pair of Hakama. They look so comfy. Um, he says they don't impede the fencer's movement or light and airy, and even speculates that with, uh, could be introduced in England in a modified form for the use of young girls. Considering how 1920s fashion kind of adopts those, uh, kind of parachute trousers, um, in 40s fashion, he's kind of right, so how about that? But either way, so far gear-wise, I mean, all his stuff has merit, and I, again, really think he would like modern HEMA gear. Um, but I just wanted to discuss that perspective, because if you haven't gotten the chance to play around with kendo gear, it is quite an interesting uh, feel. But either way, we're not to the end yet. Um, there's still some other things I want to read, but this video is going to become quite long, so I'm going to go ahead and split it here. So join me again for part two.